Hi guys, Tom Mills here, and I wanted to do something a little different uh, for the one year anniversary of Andrea's death um, instead of just a live video where I kind of talk to you guys. So I thought I'd do it more like a vlog and just kind of tell you about a little where I came from, where I'm at now, and how I got here, I guess, and uh, see where it goes. I did actually write some stuff down. A lot of you guys encouraged me to write things down, and I'm going to share some of those uh, excerpts from you, from my little personal notes uh, about different different phases in, in, in the journey over the months where I've been at. You guys see me in the lives, and you see me do everything from cry to be happy to normal and all that, but you know, in reality, it's it's been a pretty dark journey in my life, and you know, I love my kids, and I'm so glad to have them. They're they really helped me get through this, and I'm sure uh, I helped them as well. And we're just kind of all here for each other. Uh, but it's been hard, and it's still hard. You know, now a lot of you who follow the channel know that I have a girlfriend, April, and uh, things are getting pretty serious with us. And uh, I'm very glad for that. Um, but even, even, even then, having some hope for a future, it's still, it's still pretty dark sometimes. And uh, God bless her for putting up with me and. Uh, being there for me when I when I need her and and uh, and and I her as well, but I think it's a little more one sided on on my end if we're being honest. Right after she died, I had people tell me that it's going to take years to get over the grief, and I remember thinking, years. There's no way I can endure this pain for years. And I kind of thought, no, I'm sure by about a year, maybe I'll I'll be pretty much over things. And, of course, how wrong I was. But some of the things that's kept me going is just the thought that I could have hope that it would be gone. One of those things that has got me through a lot of this was the dream that I had. And I've kind of shared it before, but I wanted to share it again because it really has given me a lot of hope. And of course, as you guys know, I'm a devout Christian and my faith is very important to me. And, and so if it's not your cup of tea, I understand. But I'm just telling you what's going on in my life in this journey. I had a dream one night uh, that disturbed me. And I woke up and it was like four in the morning when I woke up. And I immediately wrote it all down uh, just as I remembered it while it was fresh. And it was about 2002 or 2003. I wish I had gotten the exact date, but it was transferred from a Palm Pilot, and so the date stamps aren't, aren't accurate. But um, so it would have been like two, two, like three, four years after me and Andrea got married. And I'm just going to uh, read my note here, just as it happened. When I awoke, it was four o'clock in the morning. I dreamed that I was working. There were other people working, but I did not look at them to see who they were. Jesus was there, dressed in a white robe with a light blue sash. He didn't speak to me. He only watched, and he sometimes motioned with his eyes and had body language. His communication was sure, only it was not audible. I was trying to remove a wall of cinder blocks. The cinder blocks were blocking something we needed to get to or somewhere we needed to go. And I could dissolve the cinder blocks by letting water run out of my mouth. And any part of the brick that the water fell on instantly ate away the brick. I didn't dissolve the whole brick, just what held them together, only because it took too much time to dissolve the whole brick. I would then carry the remains of each brick and put it in a pile. Once I was lifting a piece of brick and putting it out of the way, a bug bit me on the finger. These bugs had been around, but we just avoided them. This one was sitting on the underside of the brick. It hurt like a sting, and it was continually biting me about three or four times. And I grabbed it off my left hand with my right hand, and then it stuck to my right hand and continued biting me there. I then tried to take it off again with my left hand, and again, it stuck to my left hand and continued biting me. And I then shook it off on the floor. The bug looked like it was a black widow, only bigger, about the size of a tarantula. 
I compare it to a black widow because it had a red symbol on its abdomen. It was much too small of a symbol to make out. I only knew that it wasn't just a spot. It had one big pincer on its left arm like a male fiddler crab, and it was all glossy black. At the time when I had the dream, I figured its purpose was just as encouragement. Um, at the time, I was wrestling with the theological concept of legalism, the idea that maybe you had to be almost completely perfect and sin-free for God to accept you, and if you did anything wrong, maybe he would zap you or send you to hell or something, I don't know. And so it was really encouraging to me for him, because when he communicated with me with his body language, it was like a father would do his son, maybe. He was proud of me. I could tell he was proud of what I was doing, and it was loving. And and so just that feeling, that, that relief of that burden of uh, wondering if God was just out there mad at me was really important to me. And of course, obviously, uh, water running out of my mouth onto the bricks was some sort of way that my words are going to, you know, you know, break walls down. I don't know. I could tell it was something good. Um, the thing that mostly I would focus on uh, was the uh, the bug. I didn't know what this bug was about. Clearly, it was something that hurt, but it didn't kill me. It was painful, but I shook it off and I could basically go back on my way. And so at the time, I thought it could have been a lot of things. There was a time in my life when I was wrapped up in porn, and I thought for a while, me and Andrea talked about maybe maybe the bugs were porn, and I finally get rid of them, and, and I'm free of that now, uh, as much as a man can be, I suppose. And uh, and I figured that maybe that was it. And, and but there was other times where I, I was addicted to video games, and I played too much, and it kind of caused some relational problems in my marriage. And uh, I thought maybe that could be it. And of course, I, I stopped doing that, and I figured I shook it off. Maybe that was what the bug was all about. And we kind of would talk about it over the years, here and there. And it wasn't until Andrew's in the hospital, and this is still when I didn't know she was going to die, but in the hospital, I told Andrew, I said, Andrew, this is it. This is the bug. And uh, you'd think I would have figured out the fact that, you know, the bug was like a black widow, only a crab. And so, you know, black widows, you know, kill their spouses. And you'd think I would have figured out that this is the pain of being a widow, but that thought didn't even occur to me until until after Andrea died. And uh, and so then when she did die, um, I shared this, this dream with you guys, and uh, somebody else mentioned the fact that Andrea's sign or whatever is the cancer, which is a crab, which I thought that was interesting. I also had the thought that the crab had one big fat pincher arm, which only the males have that. So I made him a male fiddler crab. And so, uh, again, just interesting uh, that I missed this. But the thing, the way that that dream is giving me hope now is that I shake it off. And it hurts, and it's very painful, but at some point, I shake it off. And I'm holding on to that. And, you know, I, God gave me that dream just a few years after and we were married. And, and so to have, have it happen this many years later is, is baffling to me. But I've been holding pretty tight on it to know that no matter how painful this is now, that it is going to get better. And uh, that's given me a lot of peace. It's helped me get through a lot of the pain that I have just knowing that I think there'll be an end to it. But just because I had that ghost of a hope that it was going to end someday didn't mean that I wasn't feeling it really bad all along the way and, and honestly still am feeling that way even now. It has lessened a little bit over time, but honestly not that much. But I have seen in my notes how I have made progress. I don't, I didn't sound like I kept a journal or anything, but every now and then when I had a particularly difficult day or a pressing thought I couldn't escape from, I wrote, wrote a little bit down about how I was feeling on a note on my phone. So I'm just going to share, going back to the beginning, the notes in order as they happened. It feels like my life up to now was fake. 
like it didn't happen. I spent 20 years learning how to be one with her, and now it feels like I shouldn't have been doing that. I feel like when I try to do the things that need done, that used to be the things that she did, that I'm insulting her memory. One doesn't quite know what their life goal is until you're dead. Now I can see that her whole life's purpose was her family and raising our children, bringing them into the world. And I'm super angry that she had to do all the hardest parts, giving birth and poopy diapers and, and all, and, and then she didn't get to see any of them turn 18. I feel like I could be ruining her legacy, that I'm erasing her from history by not doing a good of a job as she did. I have thousands of memories that nobody else on the planet knows but me. Thousands of feelings that are just hanging out on the line, and they stab me with the knowledge that only I know them. Only I remember how it felt when each picture was taken. And the simple pictures that were once so innocuous now are laced with meaning and memory. Each moment is hyper-focused. I notice every blade of grass, every sound of the birds and wind. I walk by every woman, and I'm somehow offended that they didn't notice how miserable I am. I wish that for one minute they would stop and just talk about anything deeper than the weather. And as a result of this hyper-awareness, time just moves like a crawl. Every second I'm watching the pot of life, just waiting for it to boil. I feel like I'm just passing the time until I die. I would never harm myself, but I still can't wait until it's my turn to see what happens when I die, to see if she'll be there, and if she'll still be herself, if she will still know me. I wish we had talked about her death. I wish I had just ignored the busy hustle of the doctors and the EMT drivers and just gave her a big hug and told her that I loved her, and, and just hear what she would say back. We were afraid to say out loud that she was dying. It feels like every happy or fun thing I ever did was putting gold coins in a box, and I had saved up an amazing treasure, and then somebody came in and stole them all. Those memories went from happy to mundane at best and are painful and they make me angry at the worst. My past has become a mighty monster that I run it from and now my life is defined by my stupor of disbelief. I'm still overwhelmed with the idea that I am just indifferent towards life. I see inspiring Bible verses on the walls of customers' homes and I know they are true, but I just don't feel them. Everything is tasteless. Nothing has any real importance to me, and passion for existing at all has left me. I know it shouldn't be that way, however, and I wonder how I'll get out of this hole. It's not that I miss her and want to leave to go see her. It's that I just don't want to be here, like I've been in a giant race. And as I neared the finish line, I was in first place. But in the home stretch, I fell and broke my leg, and everyone in the race passed me, and now I'm in last place. And I'm still up, and I have the resolve to finish, but it's just hollow now, and I don't really care. I found a box of mementos and keepsakes in my shed a couple days ago. In it were some love letters from her. I read only a couple of them, and of course they choked me up. Today, I had an overwhelming urge to just rush out to them, as if she were in that box. I rushed to the shed as fast as I could, and I furiously opened the box. I pulled out a three-page letter and began to read, and it was referencing things that had happened at the time she wrote the letter, and then I realized she isn't here. I didn't even want to read it anymore. I skipped to the end and absorbed her loving comfort about the future, and I put it away. I should be able to find her. Why can't I?
Although as a Christian, I know better. I feel like whatever happens the rest of my life is just up to chance. And I don't have any expectation that it's going to be happy. Even though I have just met a woman who is very compatible and it's very excited about, it feels like anything that can happen in my life now is just an afterthought. I spend much of my time these days contemplating life and purpose. In my various study of all the different theological theories and concepts about the afterlife has caused me to start wondering, will I be able to talk with her in heaven someday in the same way I did when she was here? Now that she's living in a perfect world, will she even be the same person? Will she still love me? Every once in a while, I have a fleeting thought that I can see thinking of old memories in a happy way. Someone once told me, someday you're going to think of the old memories and they're going to bring you joy instead of sadness. And I didn't believe it then, and I don't think I really believe it now. But every once in a while, I have this ghost of a feeling that perhaps I could see that becoming true someday. While we were on vacation in Kentucky and I had that UTI and I went to the emergency room and honestly that whole event was really scarring. It was scary to be in an emergency room with a bunch of doctors, you know, of course, doing something that's fairly routine, I guess, and shouldn't normally be very serious. But, you know, I remember seeing how that was what happened with Andrea. We went in for uh, one simple, small, innocuous issue and, you know, 10 days later she was dead. And I still had all these fears in me that maybe something bad was going to happen to me. And, of course, April was with me, and this is the same kind of thing that happened to her husband in the hospital. And so I'm sure she, I know she was dealing with some of the same feelings. Uh, but that first night after being in the ER, and I came home and went to the, we went to the hotel and, and went to sleep. And that night I had a, a dream and I woke up in the middle of the night, and I just enjoyed it so much, and I should have written it down, but I was kind of just wanting to get back to sleep and maybe continue the dream, but uh, I didn't. Um, but I did write it down the next day uh, as best I could remember it, and a lot of things had already faded away as tends to happen in dreams. But I had a dream about Andrea and talking to her in heaven. Well, uh, let me just read it as I wrote it down here in my notes. I had a dream of talking to Andrea in heaven, and it was very impactful to me. I wish I had wrote it down right when I woke up from it after in the middle of the night, and now much has faded. This dream was different than how I normally dream. I didn't see her, or even myself, or really anything as it's going on, like a movie as I normally would dream. But Andrea all of a sudden was there. Again, I didn't see her. Uh, but I think I said, Andrea, is that you? And then I was looking at the image of a frosted window. And it was all distorted. And then I heard her say, what? Uh, like she didn't understand me. And I said something like, is, is that really you? And, uh, you know, it's like we had a meeting, but it was more like a phone call, really. Uh, but I, I had simple graphics that depicted what we were talking about on like a, a, a screen. That's what I saw. They were like still images. Sometimes they were moving images. Um, I became aware that this was a dream, but then I suspected maybe somehow it could also be real. And so, of course, if I'm talking to Andrea somehow in heaven, I wanted to have the most impactful dialogue that I could as fast as I could before I would wake up and I wanted to tell her and ask so many things and I think I did I think it was longer than what I have here but I, I don't remember everything or even how long it really was uh, but here's what I do remember about the things I asked her and about her responses so I asked her can you see us 
and this question is in regard to an ongoing theological study I've been doing for some time as to whether or not people who have died before us can see us down here on the earth. I mean, a lot of people think that they can, but there's not exactly Bible evidence on that. There do have some verses that I tend to support that, and so I strongly suspect that they can, but I wanted to ask her. And so since I wanted to ask the most impactful questions, I thought I need to know that answer first. And so her response to that was to agree by the way of telling me a story. So it was like, I said, can you see us? And then she said, well, yeah, the other day after breakfast and blah, 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 blah. And she started telling me a story uh, about some time that evidently she saw us or something. Or, or, and and I, at the time when she was saying it, I saw this grassy, like a hill in kind of a scattered, foggy light maybe like a sunrise or something. It was all very white and and uh, lit up. And then she continued to tell me what, whatever story she was telling me. Um, but I was so distracted and fascinated by the idea that she said that she it happened after breakfast. And that the fact that they have breakfast in heaven, and, and I think I said so, in fact. Do you guys have breakfast in heaven? And and so now I don't even remember what the story was that she was relating to me at the time, uh, but the point of it was to tell me an instance when she did see us, and and I remember when she was telling the story about seeing us that I saw a picture, an image of like an old TV, like from like you know the fifties or something, with the rabbit ears on the right side of a room looking out uh, over uh, like a sliding glass door and it was all sepia tone, kind of browns and looking all old and it was sitting in the house. And basically, yeah, that her story indicated that she could see us, but it seemed like uh, that they didn't really do it that much. It wasn't super frequent that they, they, they watched. And so the next question I wanted to ask her was, or rather it's more of a statement, I just said, I love you so much. And I, I just, I just had to tell her again. <laughs> and she, uh, she responded that you know she loved me too, but it was different than the way I said it. You know, when I said I love you so much, it was I was saying it desperately. I was saying I desperately love you in a very heavy tone, and she was saying something closer to I love you too. Like maybe uh, your spouse might say after being caught off guard by a random I love you oddly placed in the day, like maybe you interrupted her reading a book, almost in a way of saying, uh, what a curious thing to say out of nowhere, but you know, I love you too. It, it sort of seemed like that to her, we, we hadn't been apart at all. And uh, the image that I saw was sort of a black and white movie where we, we, we ran and found an abandoned room where I could hug her and kiss her. And it was a, it was a tone of fun and laughter and and I didn't want it to end. It sort of felt like it was happening, but it was more like I was, uh, it was a, a movie. And then uh, the last thing I said is I, I, I said I met another woman. And I think I said it once kind of quiet, and she didn't hear me. And so I said it more, again, more clearly and loudly, and because I needed to tell her this, and maybe maybe I was scared or timid about telling her. And then she re- she replied, you, you don't have to rush to get here. It was more like, you don't have to rush to get here. And this affected me a whole lot because it seemed to indicate that she was aware of how I had been feeling every day since she died. And I did want to rush. If I'm being honest, part of me didn't want to be here on earth anymore. It sometimes feels like the best of my life is over and maybe I'm running on fumes now. It's sort of tasteless and colorless, even though obviously I know I still have an immense job and continue to raise my family and I would never quit that or do anything stupid. Uh, But still, that's just sometimes how I feel. Uh, But the way she said the words, it had a lighter tone. It felt like she was saying it in such a way, meaning that like, I didn't have to rush for her sake. Like, you don't have to rush for me. You know, you don't have to rush to get here. Uh, that she'd basically be doing okay, and I should just enjoy the time that I had left, and there'd be plenty of time to meet up later. And she didn't say that, but that's just kind of the way she said it uh, seemed to have the meaning. 
and the image that I saw when she said this, it was something, I, I can't really describe it, it was something like the top part of a butterfly, um, and it seemed to like slide up the grass without flapping its wings or anything, while its abdomen kind of stayed still, and it stretched longer, and it grew fatter, and it turned into a, like a pretty purple color. It was kind of like waving, like one of those waving tube man guys you see at a used car lot, you know, or something with with the half a butterfly thing at the top. It was a pretty long dream, and there were other things we talked about, but those were the most important things that I wanted to say, and, and as a result, the others disappeared into a, just another forgotten dream. Uh, you know, at a couple of weeks before this, I prayed in tears that I could see her in a dream again, because I did see her once, and, and since then, I never got to see her in a dream again, and I just prayed to God. I said, I just want to see her in a dream one time. I know it's not real, but I just wanted to see her again, and and in that response, and this kind of felt like definitely an answer to prayer in, in that regard. And uh, the other times that I dreamed about her, it was much more like normal life. Like I was watching a movie. One time we were at a, eating dinner, and uh, I we were looking for some clothes for one of the girls, and we couldn't find them. And it was just it was just a random dream. But but this dream was not like a dream I've ever had before. And I don't know if it was real or if she really was, but I really felt like I really got to talk to her. So I think the first dream that I had with the bugs was to give me a hope, something to hold on to that this life, that my earthly life would turn out okay and it would, the pain would leave. And I think the other dream was kind of given to me to give me hope for the afterlife because it was something, honestly, I was agonizing over on, you know, whether or not I even see her at all. There's some theories that, you know, God just absorbs your soul when you die and you're not really yourself anymore or, or that you're so perfect, you know, that you you no longer you know, want to talk to mere mortals and you don't remember the way it was when you were a mortal and weird things like that. And so I don't know what heaven's like or I have no idea, but I, I, I needed something to hold on to. You know, I think that I, that I get to be able to see her again. And, and I feel, th- I feel that, you know, God gave me those things and and so now at this point, you know, it's it's one year later and uh, a lot of things are changing and moving on and I'm starting to plan how we're going to get the next school year going and April's helping me keep things straight and remember all the little chores that I have to do and uh, to keep things going and it, it's it's just so nice and I realize now that I've uh, I've grieved a lot more after having met her and I realize that when I was busy, I wasn't grieving. It was easy to just put my mind into whatever I was doing, just worry about working and helping customers making money. And then when I get home, I worry about making dinner and I just can make a good dinner for the kids. And then we have fun, play a game maybe. And I got to remember to do all of our fun traditions and I got to do laundry and put out fires with kids and, you know, break up fights and, you know, that sort of a thing. And, and uh, just handle all the hustle and bustle of my life. And it basically was busy 24-7. And I found the only real time that things were silent is when I woke up in the morning. And I'd wake up, and I'd be the only one awake. And that's when I started to feel sad the most. And I realized that's probably where most of my grieving was taking place. And uh, and then God brought April into my life. And I know half of you guys there are thinking, oh, it's too soon for him to be with somebody else. And I, I don't know what to tell you apart from the fact that I, I was, I'm so happy that I met her and she's helped me so much. And, and one of the big ways that she has helped me is that since this is long distance, you know, it's really hard to have a relationship long distance. If any of you guys have ever done that, I, I have quite the blessing of that she doesn't have to work and is just a stay-at-home mom. And so she could just take the kids and just pick them up and, and just go over to Wyoming. And she comes over here and she's living with my mom. And I get to see her pretty much every day. And, no, well, I mean, I do get to see her every day. And it's wonderful. And and I don't I never asked her to, but she's cleaning the house and she's scrubbing things. I mean, my bathroom smells like bleach and clean. And I can't, honestly, I can't remember the last time that it did smell that like that. It's wonderful. And she's doing so much. And now all of a sudden I find myself with more spare thought cycles in the day. 
And uh, the first time that she came, she stayed, well, she for a couple of weeks, and then she came back, uh, and she stayed for a month. And um, and I realized then when she went back to her house in Idaho for a week or, or so, that's when I did probably the most quality grieving, I guess, that I've done up to now, uh, because she was gone, and... I was missing her, and at the same time, I had my thoughts to myself, and I was feeling really good about the state of the house, and and I know that's terrible. It's not like the house was messy or anything when I was doing it, but there were just always little things, little jobs that I needed to finish. And I need to tighten the legs on the table. I need to uh, finish in the garden. I need to, all these little bitty things that always get put on the back burner. And then on the back burner so long, I forget that I they were even were there. And then I just remember that I haven't finished something. And that was like how I felt. I, I felt like I hadn't finished anything. And I'm behind in everything. And it probably wasn't so drastic. But either way, then she's gone. And I felt like everything was caught up. And I I think I did the most quality grieving that I've done and I kind of opened up the floodgates I think and and so now she's back now and and I've been more down than I was before and she's she's definitely noticed it and my kids have noticed it and I have a lot more times when I'm sad but I think I'm just doing all my grieving more now than I even was before and I started riding my bike and as I, I kind of told you guys, I kind of adopted a six foot by six foot square of grass on the side of a highway, you know, five miles away from my house. And so I ride out five miles and I decided it was always so pokey in the grass and there was nowhere good to sit. And so I, uh, I brought a little hand hoe and I brought a big bag of mulch that I strapped to my bike or a soil and grass seed and some water and I hoed me a little six foot by six foot spot there took out all the weeds put down some nice uh, soil and planted grass there some nice grass seed and my thought is to have a nice little park area there a little six foot by six foot park that I can sit on and watch the sunset because I so enjoyed sitting there and watch the sunset uh, when I'm riding my bike and there's just no really good way to sit there. And I've been trying to look at different pads and yoga mats and things I can sit on so it's not so pokey. And this just sounded like something fun to do. But then as a result, I know in order to germinate grass seed, I need to, you need to water like three times a day. And I, I, of course I can't do that. And it's in a spot where you can't really park on the side of the road. Even if I drive with my car, there's not really a shoulder there. And, uh, and so as a result, I've been going and riding my bike pretty much every day without fail so I can water that little spot I miss a couple days and and as of yet I'm not sure how long it's been it's probably been a week or two and I don't think that it's even a single grass seed has germinated yet but I'm hoping that it will and I'm not going to give up maybe need to bring another thing of soil but the bike rides have given me a lot of a lot of hope and they, they clear my mind and even even today it was a difficult day and I was pretty much down all day and and April doesn't know how to help and and she's trying to be comforting, and and of course she just tells me I should just go ride my bike, and 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 I did, and I had been kind of taking the boys with me, and it's a lot of fun to take the boys; they really enjoy riding with me. Um, but you know, she says you need to go by yourself and ride your bike by yourself, and so I did, I did, and I rode my bike out there, and I watered my little plot of grass, and it was it was just really a beautiful ride, and and uh, I came back and I felt infinitely better. And so, but you know, tomorrow is another day, and that's it's it's a day to day thing, and and we do these live videos, and you guys are all it, it really makes me it helps me a lot to talk to you guys. It's just so distracting and fun, and to have people that that support me and 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 like me, and you know, minus uh, the people that don't, obviously, but it it really helps. Uh, it helps. I need a break from feeling bad all the time, and. And uh, some days I have good. Yesterday, it was good the whole day. I had a whole day that I felt great and happy and fun. And then today, it's I made up for it, it seems like. But anyways, that's where I'm at now. And uh, I, I, I don't see what's ahead of me. I pretty much am taking one day at a time. And I don't know where the future lies. But I feel like I'm getting some good progress in my grief. And I'm really glad to have someone with me to help 
carry it, especially somebody who knows what it's like. And uh, the kids are having fun with having some new friends over and, and you know, it's it's different and nice and hectic and busy, all, all rolled together. And it's been very nice. But, well, that's pretty much all I got. I really appreciate you guys uh, listening. This uh, last year has been the most difficult year of my life. And uh, the process of grief is, is so strange and confusing. And uh, I now have a more profound appreciation for all those that have grieved before me that I pretty much just brushed off, unfortunately, for being honest. I didn't realize how heavy this load is to carry. And I know there's yet a lot more to go, but uh, now I have someone to help carry it. And I still have all YouTube and my kids and I really appreciate all the support you guys have given us and the gifts, and it's just been wonderful. And I guess we'll just see where these things continue to go. Um, now that I have uh, April in my life, you'll notice the live videos have been not as frequent, and that's uh, because I have her to talk to, and I'm very grateful for that. And, of course, the lives will continue, but I'm hoping as time goes on we'll get more and more of the vlogs uh, style, and we won't be as backed up, and we'll still have... Uh, live videos from time to time, uh, but I'm hoping that's where we get to at some point. So again, I appreciate you for watching.